All right. I'm, I think I'm going to start us a little bit earlier because uh, I'm surprised at how quickly uh, we everyone was able to log in. Maybe Zoom has a feature that you can log in really quickly. Uh, as I was saying that and estimating 10.05, we didn't have very many folks, but uh, we have uh, quite a few and, and pretty close to what we had as registered uh, for this um, meeting. So I'll get us started. Uh, my name is Gil Cerise. I'm a program manager here at uh, Petertown Regional Council and welcome to our um, August 27th regional uh, TDM stakeholder meeting. Uh, let's do a round of introductions for PSRC staff who are joining today. Erin, uh, why don't you take it away and then we'll go to Suzanne and Brian. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Hogan. I'm an associate planner um, here at PSRC and I'll pass it on to Brian. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Lee, Program Manager for Data Solutions and Research at Puget Sound Regional Council, and I work with Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, do you want to go? Yep, I'm Suzanne Childress, um, Manager of the data, the data Science Team here, and work with Brian on the Household Travel Survey Program. Great. Thank you all. And so we have, uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar uh, names uh, joining us uh, for this TDM meeting. Uh, uh, we're happy to see you all here, and we have a lot of great information to share with you. Uh, we change to the next slide, please, Aaron. Uh, similar to what we did in April, we have uh, kind of uh, meeting procedures outlined here. Uh, we're going to start off with a, a, a brief poll for introductions to give everyone a, a chance to kind of get to know who's here. Um, and we'd ask you to please mute your audio. Uh, you're always welcome to leave your video on so we can see uh, who's here and, and uh, really happy to see uh, folks uh, joining us online. Uh, we're going to have our, uh, similar to what we did in April, have uh, questions submitted uh, during presentations using the Q&A feature. You should be able to see that at the bottom uh, bar across your screen. And you can uh, submit those questions. They'll be uh, viewed uh, when, when we're answering them. Uh, so if you do have something like a, a, a technical question or challenge, we'll try to uh, handle that separately and dis, uh, dismiss that. But if you have questions about the presentations, please feel free to to um, type them in, we will respond or, or either verbally or in writing and uh, keep that rolling along uh, for everyone. There will also be a chance at the end of the meeting, similar to what we did in April for a round table and announcements at the end of the meeting, similar to what we used to do for our TDM uh, meetings in the past to be able to allow people to share information with each other about what's going on in TDM in the region and in your communities. Um, Alexa, would you go ahead and uh, uh, share the poll for the introductions? Um, for people, so uh, Zoom uh, poll. So we're getting a sense of who's here, uh, what uh, jurisdictions. Uh, how do you? How are you related to TDM and CTR planning? Uh, give us a sense of uh, who do we have in the audience today. I think similar to what we saw in the past, uh, a lot of city participation. So uh, that's great to see everyone here, uh, but also other. Stakeholders from counties, the state, uh, trans agencies, and others like TMAs and other kind of uh, entities. I think we have a uh, pretty good uh, participation. So why don't we go on to the second question, uh, Alexa? Oh, or do, do I just scroll down? Oh yeah, there's a second question. Okay, and then is your jurisdiction CTR affected? That's the second question we have on here. And again, we are gonna be talking about local CTR plans. So it looks like we have a really good uh, attendance from uh, local CTR um, uh, CTR affected jurisdictions. 81% uh, of folks uh, uh, here are, are with CTR affected. So uh, let's go ahead and end the poll and, and uh, move on to the, uh, the next slide, please. I think before we wanted to uh, launch into the information we shared on the agenda, we wanted to kind of give uh, some feedback from the last um, meeting was kind of where are things related to TDM on, on PSRC's website. And so uh, we've prepared this a few slides here to kind of give you a sense of where we're putting things. We have a, an updated uh, transportation demand management uh, web page on the PSRC website. And I think the link is down there at the bottom. You can uh, see that um, these, these slides will be up on our website after the meeting, so uh, if you aren't able to, uh, you know, get this information now, you'll be able to click on the on this website itself, this web page itself, and uh, be able to um, uh, get slides. Um, and then also information about upcoming uh, meetings uh, are also included on this page, so you'll be able to see uh, both past meetings, but also we're going to be trying to highlight what's coming up, so people get a, a good sense in advance of, of upcoming meetings. Since we don't have a, a regularly scheduled committee meetings anymore, we we basically are, are uh, developing these meetings as they as needed for uh, the work program for TDM in the region. Um, is there something else, Aaron? I should be citing on this, uh, or did I cover these topics? I know we have another one more slide to kind of share. 
Um, no, I think you okay, covered great. these. I can go to the next one. Yeah, next one. And this is showing uh, how you can, uh, but the, another way you can kind of identify when meetings are happening. We have our PSRC calendar and, and uh, not only do we have committee and board meetings on there, but events like this are listed on that on that uh, calendar as well. And then how do you get uh, uh, notified of these kind of meetings? We have our TDM contact list and uh, and uh, Aaron is illustrating at the bottom here how you can get on that um, on that list. Uh, and, and receive emails. So if you know others who are interested in TDM in your in your organization or, or others that cities or whatever that you work with, uh, please feel free to share this information and we'd like to make sure we uh, maintain a robust uh, TDM stakeholder list. Um, next slide, please. And I think now we're kind of launching into our agenda. Um, so uh, gonna start off with a, an overview of our regional transportation plan uh, that we're developing. Um, the 2026 to 2050 uh, regional transportation plan and uh, an overview of TDM existing conditions and uh, kind of work that we've done related to uh, uh, inventory uh, that we'd shared out and, and before we turn things over to Suzanne and Brian for the uh, household travel survey. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of you know, I think we, we were trying not to repeat too much from the April uh, meeting, but at that time we had uh, initiated uh, our de work development and work on the regional transportation plan with an adoption date of 2026 uh, with our board. We started that work in February of this year. And so this is a reminder slide about what's included in a regional transportation plan. These are federal and state requirements. Uh, we, we at PSRC are on an every four year cycle. Uh, so uh, our last plan, our plan that's currently in place is uh, illustrated on the right-hand side here, was ad adopted in 2022. And, uh, and we are update, we're, the next update will be due in May of 2026 to uh, maintain our federal and state uh, uh, requirements and be able to kind of uh, address the upcoming needs and, and, uh, and address um, projects that are going to be in the, in the, in the um, plan for that next time period. Uh, there's things like we have to have an integrated multimodal transportation system. And, and that, of course, a TDM is a really key part of that. Have to have a regional reasonable financial strategy to fund investments. We uh, can't have uh, just kind of uh, pie in the sky investments in there. We need to make sure the federal government does uh, uh, regular certifications with us to ensure that we have uh, reasonable financial uh, strategy assumptions in our plan. And so uh, that's something we'll be doing a lot of work with. And I think that's gonna be one of the focuses of the of the uh, plan. Uh, in particular, uh, with T related to TDM, the financial strategy includes uh, um, uh, th things like road usage charge and tolling and, and things like that that are really important for TDM. So that's an important thing for this uh, group to know about and to keep track of. Uh, we include our latest available assess estimates for growth, travel, and economic activity and the work on the household travel survey helps influence that. Uh, it helps ground truth our models in terms of uh, predicting future travel behavior and things like that. We also include performance measures and targets, uh, and many of which are uh, TDM related and address a, a variety of federal planning factors. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a very high level uh, overview of the schedule ahead of us, and, and uh, we can share out in the future here a more detailed uh, version of this, but 2024 is really about engagement and identification of plan priorities that we'll be sharing in, a, in an upcoming slide. Uh, we have been engaging with the board since February and, and, and are at a, a pivoting to a more broader engagement with the public this fall on, on plan priorities. Uh, by the end of this year, we plan to have uh, with our board uh, identification of what the scope of this uh, regional transportation plan will include. Um, most of the time, we, we're, we're basically building upon past plans. We really are implementing Vision 2050, our regional growth strategy, uh, and, and that is not changing anytime in the near future. So um, so we really uh, are kind of make mainly building upon past work as we uh, iterate upon that and, and improve upon that work. 2025 will be about analysis and development of the draft plan. And so we'll be continuing to engage TDM stakeholders through 2025 as we develop the TDM uh, narrative for our for the RTP and um, and continue to build upon the work that you uh, will be sharing today and, and we'll be getting from the local CTR plans to help us with that. And then we'll have plan adoption in May of 2026. And part of what I want to share here also is that our regional transportation plan is uh, the regional CTR plan. It meets those requirements. And so um, like many of you, when we adopted the plan in 2022, uh, washed out in the state had paused their requirements and on uh, CTR planning. So so uh, it wasn't done in, in the uh, the format that um, that uh, state's asking for now. 
uh, but it still is what we consider. We there are TDM priorities in in this plan that uh, should be accounted for in your in your um, local planning, and and then we will be making sure that when it's adopted in May of 2026. And we've received uh, uh, approval from the CTR board to be able to to do this and uh, uh, kind of off the cycle from what you all are doing, that your local CTR plans will be informing our regional uh, TDM uh, uh, work in our regional CTR plan that's adopted in May of 2026. Um, next slide, please. And and this is the um, uh, an illustration of what our board has been going through. They've been uh, uh we gave them a kind of an opportunity to give us a, a feedback early in the year. And this is that feedback we've been since then, we've been uh, working with them and refining this uh, a little bit more. Uh, I think some of the main priorities, we really are focused around climate safety and equity uh, are have been the main priorities for the, the current plan and continue to be really important. Here you see things that uh, kind of an, a reflection of emerging trends and, and different changes. The, the issues of maintenance and preservation around ferries, as, as you can see, uh, is really large on the, the board members' minds. And then transit, as usual, trying to kind of as we as we have a very transit focused plan, uh, expanding that transit service and be, making it accessible to people uh, in the, the growing or regional growth centers is really important. So this is kind of a, a reflection. You don't see TDM on here, but lots of the elements around related to TDM are included here and, and uh, continues to be a really important part of our, of our planning. Um, I think with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Aaron, for the next few slides. Great. Thank you, Gil. Um, so now that we have a sense of the regional transportation plan broadly and the role that it plays, we want to talk uh, what you all are interested in, um, the role of transportation demand management in that plan. Um, so the, the first step, as Gil kind of mentioned, is starting out with existing conditions. Um, so I know some folks have been through this process of developing TDM content for the RTP with us before, um, but I also know some folks are newer, so I apologize if this is um, repeat for any, any experienced folks. Um, but there are several places where we collect data from to really inform how we paint the picture of existing conditions of TDM in the region. The first one is the regional TDM inventory. So we did our first ever regional inventory of TDM programs in 2019 and 2020 to infer, inform the current regional transportation plan, and then uh, worked with our uh, TDM advisory committee to develop the updated version of that, which was uh, distributed last year. And we'll get a little bit more into specifics of what we collected and why um, in the next slide. Um, but we also are, are collecting information from the 2023 Regional Household Travel Survey, and we're very lucky to have Brian and Suzanne here to share some of those findings with us. Um, this is where we get really important information, such as what percentage of trips in the region are commute trips versus non-commute trips, um, and having up-to-date information is, is really valuable. So we'll be hearing about that also today. And uh, finally, um, we know several of you, based on the poll question, are working hard on your local CTR plans as CTR affected jurisdictions. And we're really trying to um, leverage all of the hard work that you are doing by pulling what information we can from those plans to supplement what we have from these other data sources. We also will look into if there's anything we can be pulling from Census or American Community Survey data um, if there, there's things we want to know about that maybe we can't get on the more uh, granular scale from these other data sources, um, that's an, an option for sort of supplementing um, this data that we've collected, as well as uh, working with partners on the ORCA usage data. Um, I think that's something we've talked about before with this group, um, but hoping to dig into that a little bit more um, once we have it to really see if that's a, a if there are findings we can really pull from that on how folks are using either Business Passport or other ORCA products. Um, and then just a few things to highlight for future consideration um, that maybe don't won't come into play for this plan, but that we are thinking about are the CTR employee survey data. So we did use data from the 2017 uh, CTR employee survey in our last plan, uh, but acknowledging that um, that has shifted with the new survey and survey tool. Um, I know Washout was encouraging folks to not try to compare apples to oranges with the old survey data and the new survey data. Um, and we acknowledge many jurisdictions are still doing sort of their first wave of 
um, surveys with the new tool. So um, we'll we'll talk about this further as time goes on to see if there's enough that have completed it that we can glean some data from it. Um, but we're hoping in the future, once this new tool and, and new strategy is more established, that that's a regular part of our existing conditions um, sort of tapestry, I guess. Uh, and then also, you know, we are using the 2025 to 2029 local CTR plans um, as much as we can. We'd like to really integrate the findings from those. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more in the future about how we can maybe streamline so we're not duplicating, asking the same questions in the inventory that you're putting into CTR plans, maybe focusing the inventory more on, on non-employer TDM efforts. Um, so these are considerations. Um, and if folks can think of any data sources that, that we're, we're missing, um, we are definitely open to that. Uh, feel free to put something in the Q&A. Um, and next, we're going to talk specifically about the regional TDM inventory, because um, as we mentioned, we've, we've brought in the experts to talk about the household travel survey um, after this. So, um, when we put together this inventory, we really wanted to build upon the 2019-2020 first ever regional TDM inventory, um, with some of the goals being to really quantify the investments and the outcomes of TDM so we could really get a better sense. Um, we've talked for many years about measuring the effectiveness and the efficiency of investing in TDM, um, but we're really trying to get some specific local numbers to attach to that. Um, we also wanted to simplify the language and um, the number of strategies. I, I know there was some confusion when we were trying to summarize data about what gamification meant. And um, so we, we were trying to make it um, simplified as much as possible so that when we roll this into the existing conditions, it's already kind of legible and um, as simple as possible. Um, also, we know in the last process, um, Kim worked with many of you um, in the previous cycle on um, sort of refining the, the questions and the data we were collecting as we went. And so I know she put a ton of work into that. And so we were trying to kind of minimize the amount of follow-up that was needed. So um, there were some things we asked this time around that we didn't ask before, because um, we were, again, trying to, to get it all, all in, in one shot. Um, uh, so some background on the status of where we're at with the regional inventory. So we distributed this last October with the goal of collecting all the data by December. Um, we did not reach that goal. I, we're still following up with a lot of folks. Um, acknowledge sort of when we set up this timeline, didn't really know of or, or have the details on the CTR plan timeline. So acknowledge that many of you are have a lot of, a lot of competing deadlines. And so we, we do understand that. Um, but we are really trying to wrap this up here um, in the coming months so we can move ahead in developing the regional transportation plan. Um, so let me just, oops, click over. There we go. Um, so we've had 61 responses. Um, and here's sort of just a, a summary slide. Um, those that are kind of grayed out are ones that we have uh, recorded responses for. And those in white are ones that we don't. I know many of these jurisdictions partner with transit agencies and counties um, to implement their CTR programs. But we also wanted to make sure that um, uh, that we are capturing any local uh, TDM work as well. And so a process we did last time of sort of confirming with jurisdictions um, that there's nothing else besides CTR. Um, so we are still doing um, follow-up to try to get this as complete as possible. Um, and again, the strategy there is we will, for those that are CTR affected, we will first look at your CTR plan and see if we can get what we need from there, um, and if not, might follow up. Additionally, for those that have already responded, we will be doing um, follow-up if we have maybe questions, because we're really starting to dig into the individual responses now. So- um, Aaron, uh, you, there's a question. Uh, do you oh, want to uh, answer? Uh, are you still accepting inventory responses? Can we submit them after the September 20th CTR plan deadline? I think you, you might be covering this in a future slide, but I just wanted to note that and see if um, yeah, sorry, I was trying to, oh. um, yeah, so, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the link is in the, no, why my mouse isn't working all of a sudden. Well, um, coming up here, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the link is in, um, this 
uh, previous slide, slide 11, and um, it is still open if you want to complete it after the 20th deadline. That would be super helpful. Um, so please do if, if you can. Um, and so I'll, I'll continue checking it before um, maybe sending an email kind of nagging about it. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, so I think that's everything on the status of the inventory and what our, our plan was for it. Um, but based on the responses that we do have, we did want to share some initial findings. I think we had planned to be a little further along maybe at this juncture, but um, still wanted to share what, what we're seeing so far. Um, so we did get 61 responses and 32 of those indicated they do implement TDM and that will trigger when you um, answer the questions that will trigger all the other questions about what what your TDM program is like. Um, and so those uh, many of those that responded no are maybe smaller jurisdictions, non CTR affected jurisdictions um, that don't have maybe the resources resources or capacity um, to to do additional TDM work. Um, and then we also did summarize of those responses. Um, kind of the organization type, um, which again, I think underlines there's a variety of folks implementing uh, TDM and involved in this space. Um, but city city really was the, the, the big one, um, knowing how many jurisdictions we have. We reached out to um, all the member jurisdictions um, from PSRC and all of our transit agencies so um, that they are well represented. Um, a finding that I think underlines things that we've heard from this group of stakeholders before, uh, but now I guess we have the, the data to support it, um, is the value of partnerships in the TDM space. So we asked some questions about um, how an organization contracts with another jurisdiction or organization to implement TDM. And of the 32 responses that said, yes, we do TDM, 27 of them engage in contracting with partner jurisdictions or organizations. Um, so that's 84%. So that, that's it, it leads to some challenges in trying to get um, clear, clear data on, on TDM because there is so much Who's, who's reporting out on which things? Um, is it the person who funds it? Is it the person who actually administers it? Um, so we did our best to make this as clear as possible in the inventory, um, and we'll kind of keep untangling that as we, as we dig further into the data. Um, we also asked a question, I, I know there was some uh, back and forth over the term of audiences, but um, kind of which which markets or or audiences does an organization really target their TDM activities toward? Because we really want to get a sense of how much of the TDM activity in the region is really commute focused, whether that's CTR or other um, commuter employment focused programs, and how much is maybe broader TDM. And so, um, and folks could select multiple uh, categories. So many um, of, of those that implement TDM, again, we had those 61 responses, but about half of them are folks that just said, I'm a jurisdiction, I don't do TDM. So we're kind of using that 32 number moving forward for the rest of the analysis. Um, so, but many of them target targeted multiple audiences kind of based on just the, the number of responses here. And um, commuters and employers or employment transportation coordinators, ETCs, were the top two categories. Um, and if you sort of add those together, that is overwhelmingly um, the most popular audience. Um, but we did have 21 uh, jurisdictions or, or agencies indicating they do broader TDM work, which is um, a, a valuable finding. And the final thing we wanted to cover from this sort of initial glance at the data is the strategies that folks are using. Again, we really tried to simplify this down. Um, last time we had a lot more categories and there was a little more nuance to them. Um, but I think that that proved challenging when it came to aggregating up all of the data. So we focused on uh, financial incentives and strategies, non-financial incentives, marketing, education, and then there was an option for other if, there's a strategy you use that you didn't feel felt um, didn't feel fell into one of those categories. 
So um, we pulled out, acknowledging this was sort of the bulk of our responses, the commuters and the employers and or ETCs categories, um, and really um, consistent with our findings from last time, education and marketing are some of the top strategies, acknowledging these are usually um, low cost TDM strategies, and we know many are working within a very, very budget constrained environment. Um, so we'll, we'll keep kind of digging into these by each of the audiences, but we wanted to just sort of provide one example. Um, and so as we get more data from additional responses to the inventory and fill in gaps, maybe in things we can find from CTR plans, um, we will uh, continue updating all of this. And then uh, finally, we wanted to talk a little bit about the next steps. So I think this does kind of get to the, the question that came up. We are still accepting responses. So if you saw your jurisdiction as like a has not responded yet and you want to complete that, that we would really appreciate that. Um, and then we'll also be trying to fill in some gaps with data we can find from the CTR plans. But again, acknowledging that's just sort of one slice of the broader TDM environment. Um, and then there we may be following up with folks that have already completed the survey with some question with some questions as we dig more into the data. Um, then we'll also uh, moving beyond the inventory specifically back to kind of broader existing conditions. We'll also be analyzing other data sources um, that we listed on that earlier slide um, and then kind of summarizing these existing conditions and the state of TDM um, all together, pulling from all of these data sources and also some of the work we had done previously with the um, TDM Advisory Committee, developing kind of a regional context that explained how TDM works in the region. Um, I think, again, the legibility of TDM continues to be a, a challenge. So we're really Really trying to think about all the audiences that might be reading the regional transportation plan or audiences you all may be trying to message to and making TBM as understandable as possible, um, but also trying to kind of make it rich with the findings from our data. So um, and thanks, Dale. Aaron. Before before we turn yeah. it over, I think maybe just kind of I would like to reemphasize the point like that Aaron said. Uh, we do need, we do want uh, as close to 100% as we can get out of this. It's a very, we are a very large and diverse region. Our, it's not because we want to kind of like create work for you. It's our board is interested in that. And they oftentimes would ask about things. And, and sometimes it's the jurisdiction that didn't turn in uh, the materials. It's really difficult at that point to be able to kind of say, oh, well, I'm sorry, you know, we didn't actually get that information because we sent out the survey. So this is why we try to get as close to 100% as possible. I think kind of the finer point is kind of what response to the question earlier, and it was Aaron was saying, just reiterating, I think we've also realized that as we're doing this, this local CTR requirements are coming out. And we're actually hoping and wondering if, if some of the data that we need out of the survey will be coming out of those local CTR plans. So Aaron, I think that's, if it's not inaccurate to say that if you haven't filled out the survey, Please do so. I mean, it shouldn't take ten months <laughs> to do to do this survey. Uh, and but we're also interested in knowing if if this survey is something that is like a, uh, if there's an additional burden, too many questions. I think part of the thing is Aaron and I've just dis, uh, discerned out of this is that people are turning over in the TDM world here that we are maybe sending out the survey to the wrong person or the, somebody who's retired or moved on. And so it's been a really kind of hard thing to both you know. It's both hard to articulate TDM and what it is, and that's part of what we're trying to do here for our board, uh, uh, but also to keep track of where the contacts are. So so anyhow, uh, before we turn it over, is there are there any final questions on this inventory information before we turn it over to Suzanne and Brian? And I'm looking at the Q&A uh, section. I don't see anything, so maybe we can just turn it on over to uh, you, Suzanne. Thanks, Gil and Aaron. I'm going to share my presentation. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about the Household Travel Survey Program that Aaron was alluding to that hopefully will be useful to you all in doing all of your work moving forward. Um, I would like for lots of questions in the question and answer. Like I just have, a, I've attended so many webinars over the past few years where it's just like 
kind of, I'm not that engaged. And so I think it would really help with engagement if there would be a lot of questions. So my uh, co-project manager, Brian Lee is here and he knows everything I know and more. So like, please ask, put questions. I'm gonna, there's gonna be a lot of content and a lot of technical information here that we're just gonna like fire hose at you. So just like someone just do a question. Now. Okay, no, you don't have a question yet, but that's okay. So anyway, so I've been at PSRC for about 12 years and um, Brian and I have been managing this travel survey program for the past, I think, I don't know, five or six years. So we've built a lot of knowledge in this area. So today I'm going to talk to you about the travel survey program, what it is, uh, remind you if you already know, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into working at home. As Erin was just talking, I was remembering the thing of expanding out our thinking of TDM beyond just the commute. And now I'm just going to be talking about commute stuff, but it's because like this transformation in working at home is this the biggest change in the in data that I might have seen during my career. So it's pretty like exciting, even though, you know, non-commute matters too. Um, I'm going to touch on how did that working at home information intersect with the system, the transportation system at, overall. And I threw in a couple things about transit pass ownership and parking benefits. And then I'll talk a little bit about upcoming work in the 2025 survey. So our Puget Sound Regional Travel Survey Program has been going on for a really long time. In fact, all the way back to 1961. And so you can see we've done a lot of waves of, of data collection and um, the data has been really useful for academics, but also for the planning community. Recently, we've gone to more frequent surveying to try to really capture trends and understand you know, interrelationships between changes to transportation and changes to, you know, our world and how that impacts how people are traveling. So we completed a six-year program from 2017 to 2021, um, capturing households every two years. And that went really well. And so we decided to embark on an eight-year program and I'm going to mainly talk today about the 2023 um, data, uh, but I will touch on some of the data coming from the previous years. And so we do, we are actually embarking on the 2025 right now. Brian and I are very busy, like starting to ramp up for that. So I, I'll mention that a little bit. So what is this household travel survey program? So what the surveys do is we capture regionally representative data for activity, travel behaviors, and demographics of residents on a typical weekday. There's a few things to break down here. So representative, that means we really do want it to represent the people of our region. It's, um, so some other surveys are, you know, can be like, respond if you want, right? We're really trying to make sure that we're representing who, is in our region accurately. And that is can be a challenge, but it's something that we work on. And 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 also notice that it's regional. So it the level of fidelity that we can report at is regional. Sometimes we can break down below regional to like say a county or a some cities, but we just we don't have enough data to be able to really drill into neighborhood by neighborhood what is going on. Um, and then note it's residents. So we're asking households. We send postcards out to households who live in the region. So that so that means it's not um, it's not visitors. It's not visitors. Uh, it doesn't include you know the freight community. We're asking people what they did in their household. And it's on a typical weekday. We do capture some weekend behavior, but we don't have enough for um, to make it represent a weekend. So we have looked into looking at weekend behavior, but for the most part, we're trying to capture this typical weekday. And typical weekday is a little challenging. I don't know if you guys can imagine. Um, 
typical is n things are not as typical as they used to be. You know, like there's a lot more variability across the week. Um, so I mean, that's a challenge that we're working on considering. So why we've done this multi-year program, again, this frequent snapshots really help in like, as you can imagine with COVID, having this big thing happen, we could kind of track coming in and going out and um, computer, um, similar to the American Community Survey, we can pull multiple years of data together to get a more robust sample size. Um, it's really helped having the multi-year program to like for our program for project management and for like budgeting. So the travel survey data has two main uses. So one of them is the one I've been alluding to a lot, which is trends and trying to understand travel behaviors. Um, but the, where the primary reason came for these survey data is to develop our, our travel models, our land use and travel models that represent the, the travel in the region. They're kind of like the backbone of trying to understand the interrelationships between land use, demographics, the transportation network, and using that to forecast what will happen if we make changes. The travel survey contains like a huge wealth of data, you know, on the, the questions of who, where, when, why, and how. Oh, actually I have a question for you since no one's asking any questions. Has anyone ever received the travel survey? And if so, it can even be Aaron and Gil, you can answer. <laughs> Did you, what was your experience with it? I don't know, I think Gil might have received it, I'm not sure. Uh, no, I, I, my brother did. I, I, Your I, brother, brother did. Yeah, yeah. He lives a few blocks from me. So. I'm not sure if he turned it in. <laughs> <laughs> so what it points out is this is a, it's, it's a heavy survey to take. You have to answer a lot of questions, but that's what makes it so valuable because you have the connections between people as they report, you know, their, their characteristics and then also what they actually did. So a lot of a lot of times in data we make these inferences about you know who somebody is like we don't even know but we infer we know that that's not like awesome right there's a lot of bias in that so that's what makes this this survey pretty special uh, another thing that makes the survey special is that we do capture like all the travel behavior in the day not just the commute behavior so all the other things people are doing and how they do it with their household. So some planning and policy questions um, that we can answer with the survey is like, how much do people walk depending on their home location? Uh, how does transit use vary by race? And that includes, you know, non-commute. Um, what kinds of households get home deliveries? We have a question about whether you receive package deliveries or food deliveries. How often do workers typically telecommute? And, um, what households are displaced from their homes? We have some questions around where you used to live. And... So as I kind of mentioned, what's really special about the travel survey is you have these directly observed demographics, like age, disability, education, gender, and then you have what those demographics actually did and what like the different characteristics they have. So like if they have an electric vehicle where they're charging it. So you can you can kind of, what I was kind of imagining with this one is you can kind of draw lines between these demographics and then like each of the planning topics. But then I was like, I don't know how to draw all the lines. Just, I mean, sometimes it gets hard with the sample sizes being low. We have a few new questions. We have a new question in 2023 about disability. And we also have a new question about um, sexual orientation. And we have a question, a new question about electric vehicle charging. Okay, I'm gonna go into this working at home stuff. I found it really exciting to get to work on this in the past year. Um, as I mentioned, it's just like this kind of, I 
feel like it's something that since the beginning of my career, however many, many years ago, something we've talked about. And it was like, you know, sitting there at like this, you know, five, six, seven percent people working at home. And then this thing happened. And it's like, to me, it's like this kind of revolution. And I so it's really interesting to study. So for this analysis, I define three broad categories of fully at home, people who always work at home, hybrid, people who work at home sometimes and work somewhere else sometimes, and then fully in person. So people who always work at a location. Um, sometimes, I'm gonna mention something. Sometimes people call fully at home remote workers. I chose to call it fully at home to differentiate the fact that some people who are fully at home may have a business that they own. They don't have another location that they are is remote. There are other, some people who just, that's where they work. So I, I just like to, I haven't dug into exactly what share of people that is, but I just want to point that out because I do feel like remote has a bias towards, you know, professional employment and there, there's people doing other stuff. So to define these three categories, I had to combine two questions in the survey. We didn't like kind of directly ask, there's such a variety of working at home uh, that you probably have observed. You know, there's, there's people who go in three days a week. There's people who go into the office and come work at home in the evening. Um, and as I was mentioning, there's people who, um, who, who work at home, but they don't necessarily work on a computer. Um, they could be an artist. They could be doing many other things. So this kind of required a little bit of like definitional sleuthing. It took me a little while to get to this. So the two questions we have are current work location and the days a week working at home. So here's what the question looks like. Uh, which of the following best describes your current work location? And people could answer, they go to one location only outside the home, which is what we used to think of as like traditional work. Work only from home or remotely, telework or self-employed. Telework some days and travel to a work location some days. Work location varies going to different locations. Drive, bike, travel for work, driver, salesperson, deliveries. So before I go into the definitional thing, I just want to mention there are a substantial amount of people whose work location regular vary, regularly varies or they drive, bike, travel for work. Let's be, like We kind of tend to bucket into like, oh, people do this or they do that. But actually, there's like a fair number of people who don't fit into like the traditional like going to a work or teleworking some days. There's people doing other things. There's a variety of ways of working. So the main thing from this question that we took away was the uh, this one of working only from home or remotely. Those people are going to be called are fully at home people. So let's take those people out. They're not fully at home people. So then the fully at home people didn't answer this question, which is how many days do you work from home or telework instead of going to work that day? So they didn't answer that question. So we needed a dividing line between hybrid workers and fully in-person workers. And I chose to define hybrid workers to, to be people who work from home one day a week or more. That's just where, where I chose to divide it. We could go to never, but I don't think that's what people, people's common like understanding of what hybrid work is. Like, I don't think people think of, oh, you're less than monthly, you telework. That, I don't think that's, that doesn't match kind of common understanding. So that's the definitions that I use. Oh, okay. So here's some data after that long wind up. Okay. I'm gonna try something. Nobody's using the Q and A, or maybe they were and I didn't see it. We, we did get a question, uh, Suzanne and Brian answered it. So yeah, that's great. Oh, great. Um, but if, so, if, you, if people do have questions, uh, uh, yeah, please feel free to jump in. These are this, really I'm going to try this, people. Okay. This is what I'm going to try. What do you notice in this data? 
I'm showing you some data. And it shows the share of workers regionally who work at home into those, those three buckets of fully at home hybrid and fully in person. And I think you can unmute yourself and, and respond to Suzanne if people want to. So please feel free to join in. You can take a minute to look at it too. There's a lot of data here. Oh, I see. Is it possible to share data for specific cities, city or cities? Going back to it's regionally representative. I'm going to say only big cities. But you actually, you can purchase, Brian's helping too. You can purchase um, add-on samples. We we have that every two years. You can purchase add-on samples for your city. And, and if you do, you may be able to answer more questions with your data. I don't know if anybody's going to answer anything about this, but I'm still going to just leave it here for a minute because I think it's better if you like engage with the, the thing and then I'll just come back and tell you the answers. <laughs> yeah, Veronica. One thing I'm finding interesting about this, um, just at first glance, is between 21 and 23, the there is very little change between the hybrid, but then the fully at home or fully in person seem to change quite a bit between those two years, which is just an interesting observation, I guess. I think that's interesting too, yeah. And we've doubled the number of people fully working at home from before the pandemic. That's that's, that's good. What I would say, like five to six percent to now twelve percent, right? Go ahead, Reid. I don't know if you can unmute yourself or. Um, so do you want me to go back to my definition of hybrid? So I want to, so I'm going to clarify it again. So we had two questions. The first question to put people into buckets of where their home location is. And if they said they worked only from home, I, I labeled that person fully at home. They were taken out of the data set. Then if the person said, so they don't ask this question. If you said you're fully at home, if you work only at home, you don't answer this question. And then I asked them, how many days a week do you work from home or telework instead of going to work that day? And then I labeled the people hybrid workers. Someone pointed out about what if you're, why are you hybrid if it's five plus days per week? I don't know. Why did they answer that they didn't? Why didn't they answer? They said they worked only at home. So only for only at home. That's was just a, Maybe I should have like taken the people that maybe I should have taken these five plus people and like not included them. I'm not sure how many people there were actually in this that fit in this category. It's probably not that many, but I'll I can look back into it. I'm not sure that they would um I guess I was like using their their self-definition here as fully at home, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make that much sense to me. Okay. That's probably and Ray, do you want to do you have, you have your hand up? Do you want to uh, uh, respond to Suzanne's question? I think he's unmuted, but we're not, or at least I'm not hearing yeah, I'm anything. Not so yeah. sometimes with headsets okay. and stuff, that gets hard. Here's some other things that I, I found interesting in the data. Um, so one thing that we always want to keep in mind is it's still the majority of workers are fully in person. So we still need to help people get to work in the morning a lot or wherever, whatever time of day that they need to get to work in wherever it is, there's still, it's still the majority of people. Within the hybrid category, there's going to be a lot of diversity of 
a patterns of number of days per week and how they're spending their time. Um, so I could, I could have sliced this a little more. I think that's an interesting point. The balance is still rebalancing. Yeah, I think so too. So 2025, what's it going to say? Okay, let's move on. So then um, we try to look into the data in terms of demographically who works from home and who doesn't. I work from home. I'm the hybrid worker, right? Uh, I'm actually at my work desk there, but and then this person on the right cannot work from home, obviously. Oops. Their work has to be out in the world. Okay, this one is not that surprising, but it, you know, bears saying because that's what the data is showing. Working at home really varies very strongly by the industry of the worker. Uh, in this case, I'm defining working at home, working at home one day a week or more. So up to fully working at home or one day a week or more. That contains a lot of different variety as well, but not surprisingly, there's a very strong correlation between job industry and working at home. So that people in professional or business services, 75% work at home one day a week or more, down to healthcare and education where it's more like 25%. I'm really glad that you guys are writing stuff in the chat now. Oh, that's a good question about the 2025 survey about changes. Huh. Well, maybe we can do that in the end. Okay. So what I saw in the data, this is kind of my, what I'm observing is resulting from job industries. A lot of other demographic things also correlate with working from home. So Job industries correlate with income. Job industries correlate with working from home. Income correlates with working from home. Maybe there's another like interrelationship, but that's kind of, I feel like that's a strong hypothesis of the relationship. So in um, for workers who are in households that make under 75,000, 22% work from home. Uh, for workers in households making over 200,000, uh, 56% work from home. So this, this household income, it's not the worker income. So it's not like a direct correlation between what they're doing, but it's just kind of a, you see this relationship. So this, so I think there's this relationship to these professional jobs and higher incomes and, and working from home. Uh, in sometimes it can be a challenge to work with the travel survey data and report on different populations because of the sample sizes. But here are some of the things that stood out when I was you know, digging into the demographics of who's working from home. So about 37% of all workers um, worked at home. So that's, that again, loosely defining working at home as one day a week or more, but a substantially lower share of African-American workers um, work at home. I think a lot of that probably again, correlates with job industry and the job industries uh, available to African-American workers um, because of the history and legacy of structural racism. And um, so I think that's that explains some of that lower share there. Um, young people have lower share of working at home Young workers who are age 18 to 24, it's only 9%. And really interesting in this data set was that women workers worked at home is about the same as the regional share overall, um, 37%. I don't completely understand that. Uh, we want to dig into it more, but that's something that we saw. And it doesn't necessarily match patterns we've seen before. So I think that's something that we just are going to have to look into. Um, we do ask about other gender identities in the travel survey. We ask um, of, if people identify as non-binary or another gender, but we don't have enough data to report on, on that. So there's a lot of groups here where we actually don't have 
quite enough data to report. So I pulled out findings that we're, we're confident about. Um, so moving on to where do workers who work from home work, work and live? So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to like flip our heads one way and then the other way. Okay, so I'm gonna start with where do workers who work from home work? What do you think the answers are? You you know the answers. Liz. <laughs> you might not know all of them, but you probably know. Okay, so workers. I'm gonna show you some data on workers by work location who sometimes work away from home. The reason I'm doing this is I'm taking out those people who are fully at home. The results can be a little counterintuitive and hard for you to think, think about when you take those, when you include the fully at home workers. So I'm just gonna talk about workers who have a work location somewhere. Uh, would you look at that? You see there's a really strong variation across the region. Oh, this shows an example of the kind of geographies we can report on, the level of geography uh, that we have sufficient samples for. So we can we can re report the counties and we can report um the big the big places. It's really just an, a matter of like how many the numbers we have. So if in Pierce County, um, hybrid work is about 10% of workers who have a work location that's not at home. And then UC Seattle downtown went all the way to 67% of, of workers yeah. whose work location is downtown have a hybrid pattern. So this is a really strong variation. And again, I have this you know, hypothesis with the correlation with industry, where the industry, where the industries are that support working from home is then that has a kind of downstream effect. Like, oh, I saw this in the newspaper last week. I don't know if you guys saw this. And it's about the downtown foot, foot traffic. And um, so just a reminder that the 2023 travel survey was kind of, it's a point in time. Oh, who is, somebody's mentioned a little while ago about how, oh, some of these things are still in flux. So we were looking at this data, but that was a point in time in 2023. I think this reinforces this person, what you were saying. I can get, yeah, we can get the hybrid working rates compared to fully at home versus, I think I might've looked at that, Bradley. I think I might've actually looked at that and I didn't, I think it wasn't interesting, but I can look at it again. So yeah, I just thought, I don't know. I think this is interesting. It's still showing this increase, but I feel like what I don't know, like I, I question this data source. I don't know how you guys feel. This is one of these big data sources that they can sell to the newspaper. And so they're saying work, work or foot traffic. How do I know that like I think they get it from like people's smartphones and they can infer where the people live I don't know this is a little questionable to me that's why I like the travel survey data because we kind of can even though it's low sample size like we know what we're getting and we can actually like report more margins of error and stuff like this so like how do they know that's really the workers like anyway it probably is an increase and it probably is resulting from from mandates to go back to the office more often Okay. Okay, let's flip it around. So this is workers by where they live, by their work at home patterns. I flipped in the people are fully at home now, because I think it's easier to think of that, like you're fully at home, where do you live? It's kind of more intuitive. Um, you can look at that for a second.
So one thing that struck me when I was looking at this is like the kind of lower amount of variation in fully working at home by where people live. And I guess that makes sense with the industry, like people, I don't know. I don't know if I have a ton of hypothesis on that and I don't really understand why Bellevue has a higher share. <laughs> so people might have it. There, it seemed like there's more variety in the hybrid shares than the fully working at home. But there's there's less correlation with the home location and working at home than with the work location. Okay. This is like the trick. This part is the part that I think is the coolest, but it, it you takes a little bit of thinking. At least I think it does. So we have these three categories of working at home. How do those relate to what people do throughout the rest of their day? Like that's the real thing we want to know, right? We we also really want to know causation. Like how does working at home cause these things? I'm not going to get to that. I'm not going to get to causation. I'm going to tell you some correlations. Okay, in the travel survey, we ask people about how they 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 take trips throughout their day. Where do they go to do the things they need to do? Um, so we ask them about everything they do and how they get there. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about the concept of a trip. A trip is you have an activity at one location that you're doing for some amount of time, and you have an activity at another location. And a trip is that whole path. You might take multiple modes on that same trip. You might, you know, walk to one bus. You take one bus, you take another bus, then you walk. We're going to call that whole thing a trip. So I'm just, just to clarify, that's what we're calling a trip, is one, one activity location to another activity location. And then on those trips, we, we ask people like, why are you traveling? Like, why are you doing this? And they can answer many different things. They can answer like, I think there's like 25 different options. Just imagine all the things that you might say while you're traveling to do something. Well, I put those into three buckets. Those many reasons of that they could be traveling for this analysis. And the three buckets were like errands, shopping, and school, um, which I kind of think of as like somewhat mandatory purposes that aren't work. Social recreation and eat meals, kind of like non-mandatory things people need to do, and then work and work related. And so, and then I computed the number of work week trips by the different work at home groups. So the work I just Monday through Friday. How many how many different of these trips did they make? So that's the grounding information. And what the data showed was that working at home correlates with taking less work trips. That's <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's just not that surprising, right? So work, so fully at home. They still are taking some work or work related trips. So it's a person could be fully at home, and then they they need to still go somewhere to do some some work related activity. Um, the hybrid workers were taking fewer work 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 and work related trips than the fully in person. But I think the big thing to point out here is if you sum up those other trips. It's pretty similar across the groups. So I think we talk a lot about like what trip substitutions going on, like, oh, so the people aren't taking work trips and then they're going to do something else. And the data is like overall showing that. I don't know. I have, feel like I might need to look at some of the variation. And it, and again, it may not be causative. These may be different kinds of people that need to do different kinds of things. It may have something to do with the geography of where they live, but overall, like 
there's not some like big obvious thing going on in terms of sub trip substitution. Suzanne, Maya has her hand up. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, just a quick question about the last slide. Are those trips trips that occur anytime during the work week or just during like work hours? Oh, anytime during the work week. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't include the like whatever might be happening on the weekend too. Like that's something we've talked about how things are really fluctuating in terms of like what people do during the week and what they do on the weekend. And I think that's just something we're gonna keep digging into. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about trip mode share, how people get on their trips, no, how people travel on their trips by these groups. Um, so, and it's all trips I'm going to talk about, not just the commute trip. It's all the trips that they made on their weekdays. Um, what, what modes they took. Um, I classified the trips into some kind of broad bins of modes. First thing that always stands out, we do live in the United States of America. Everyone drives. <laughs> Don't have to be really thinking about So, okay, sorry. Driving is the dominant mode across any kind of, well, any kind of working at home pattern. We see this interesting higher levels of walking for hybrid and fully at home workers. Really quite substantial. Again, we can't say that it's like this causative thing of like, well, they're working at home. We know that's why they're walking because it could be about where they live. It could be a lot of things, but it, it does indicate there's some relationship there. And it, it does make sense that there would be a relationship because it's like people having more time in their day. Maybe they have more time for walking. They Maybe they're not doing that drive commute in the morning. Maybe they go for a walk around the block. I wish I would do that, but I don't do that. We also see the transit rates are higher for the hybrid workers. And if you think back to like where the hybrid workers work, it makes sense that their transit rates are higher. Okay. This one's what I think is really, real cool. Vehicle miles traveled for work week, Monday through Friday, per worker by their work at home. Their work at home status, those three categories. Um, so the number of miles that they're basically generating in vehicle miles traveled. And you can see there's a pretty strong correlation between working at home and lower vehicle miles traveled, especially for that fully at home group. We don't really know like how much of that is from working at home, but especially for the fully working at home, like maybe that's a different group of people, although it is 12%. So I, I do still see this as pretty strong evidence for working at home being a great TDM tool. So I was like kind of curious of like how much could I start like slicing to look at to control a little bit for confounding factors that might be making the vehicle miles traveled lower for the for the working at home groups. So I controlled for home geography is one thing. So this is looking at where the home county, where the worker lives, and then their, their work at home grouping, and then the, the average um, work week vehicle miles traveled. 
And what I what I saw in this data was, well, there's a lot of different things to see in the data, but one thing was like, you know, for any particular county, it's descending. So descending by, you know, working at home groups. So, you know, in King County, the fully in-person workers um, travel about 123 miles per week. The hybrid workers in King County, it's 73. So, so kind of it's showing, you know, controlling for home geography, you see this kind of like relationship. Um, clearly some geographies have higher amounts of vehicle miles traveled because of the land use in the built environment and transportation network. These fully at home people, they really have a pretty reduced vehicle miles traveled. How are we doing for time, Gil or Aaron? Um, I think we're, uh, we just have a couple more minutes, but I guess this is a good opportunity for us to say, I think you have about seven or so more slides, Suzanne. Yeah. And I do think mm -hmm. uh, like some, some of Brian's responses, like maybe we can kind of follow up with a couple of things. I think you were alluding to maybe some verbal follow-up on that, Brian. And then I think we also want to ask some questions and make sure we have some good opportunity for people to provide feedback. If there's other things that they would like to us to look into on this. So I'm going to propose that we go for uh, till like 1125. So give you like another 10 minutes, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, sounds perfect. Okay. And I think we have enough time, everyone, for, for the other things we have on the agenda. Just going to go a little bit long on this. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, so here's what I would take away, like, as far as, like, I, I showed you a lot of stuff. Um, I think a numbers to keep in mind, 63% of workers always worked outside of the home in, in 2023. So the majority. 25% um, had hybrid and 12% always worked at home. So those are just, I think that's like a helpful like number to have in mind, but it's regional. So for in your city, may, it may be different. <clears throat> I wanted to make a pick of like a diagram for this that shows the relation, like there's industry, there's geography and their demography and they're interrelating to result in working from home. I couldn't really, I was like working on it. Like I was like, I was having trouble. Like, how am I going to draw these arrows? Okay. I ran out of time. So these things all correlate together and kind of result in something, but the, like a lot of job industry probably does drive a lot of it. And working from home correlates with lower vehicle miles traveled and more walking, even when controlling for home geography. So, okay, so we drilled in on this one thing, which was this working from home amounts, which was this exciting change. But system-wide, it's kind of good to keep in mind, like we, the the data showed, you know, in 2019, the vehicle miles traveled on an average weekday was 88 million. It went down to, you know, below 80 million. And, and actually we do have the 2023 data point. It's 82 million. It's like, I just got the data yesterday. So 82 million, so it's inching back up. So it's exciting. There's this big change. It's, you know, in the scale of the region, it's not like this huge thing. Although it is important because it's like at the most congested times and all that, but it's good to keep that in mind. So I think it's reasonable to assume that most of the VMT reduction is is coming from working at home we saw there wasn't like a ton of like subs at least for workers there wasn't a ton of substitution going on oh the 2023 data is available this is it's not available it's available but i just couldn't make the chart yet on the other hand there's been a bigger impact on transit as you probably all know right you're probably working in that day to day so here we're showing the January through May total boardings trend. Um, January through May, just so I could put 2024 on there, because we you don't have the 2024 data yet. So I just put I put January through May just so we can show. You know, it still is increasing. In 2023, we had this, we had this relatively bigger impact on transit than driving um, occurring. And this is my conclusion, but you know, the places where transit is viable are the same places where telecommuting is is viable, which is dense office location, dense places, 
So they're just like a big, there's a bigger impact. Okay, so completely switching gears, we have these um, benefits, about, uh, these questions about commuter benefits. And they are things like, do you have free transit pass? Do you have free parking? Do you, can you have a compressed work week? Do you have the ability to work from home? Don't know, none of the above. Um, I wanted to look into this more. Gil asked about it, and a lot of times it's been really interesting information for your group, but I didn't get as much time as I'd like. So if there are other things you want to look at it about, please let me know. I'd love to get it for you. So one of the questions is, do you have fully subsidized transit through your work? Um, and the data shows, and it's shown this for a while in the past years when we look at it, it has this uh, like U-shaped distribution. If it's sideways, it's not U-shaped. I don't know why you would call that shape. It has this, it has this shape distribution. <laughs> anyway, so where the lowest incomes are more likely to have fully subsidized transit and the highest level of incomes. And I think my conclusion to like you guys would be like, how can we get some more subsidies in these low middle income groups? Like, in fact, why isn't, why isn't work, why doesn't all workplaces fully subsidize transit? That's what I want to say. I know like people talk about free transit, but why don't we just do it fully through work? I don't know, that there is a little political aside. So on the other hand, with subsidized parking, uh, basically, the more income, the more likely you have fully subsidized parking. Probably not surprising. It's, an, it's a benefit that just, you know, you're more likely to get it the more wealthy you are. And maybe it also has to do with the industries and where they're located needing to have fully subsidized parking. Um, I, I was curious, and 35% of workers who have fully subsidized transit also has fully subsidized parking. I suggested yesterday to like our team, like Brian and Gil and Aaron, like, can we convince some of these employers with fully subsidized parking to like, and fully subsidized transit to only subsidize transit? They seem to think that is, I am being a idealistic. There's no way that's gonna happen. <laughs> but I, I just think, <laughs> So we have a lot of um, presentations coming up. If you're interested in this, we have a lot of other topics to look at. Um, things like walk, bike, and roll, our information about disabilities, transit, deliveries. So we have a lot of different presentations coming up and we can share that with you later if you're interested in hearing some more. Uh, our 2025 program has started. As mentioned, we'll be we'll be collecting data in in March through June of 2025, and then the data will be available in 2026. And there's my contact information and Brian's contact information. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for us, uh, Brian. I think you had some uh, some questions in there about like sample sizes and uh, reaching underrepresented folks that you we might want to respond to verbally or like talk about. Yep. Um, Let's, uh, I, I have one that's sitting in the parking lot here. Oh. So oh, I was hoping Suzanne, you wouldn't, uh, can you just put your slides back oh, very yeah, quickly? Sure, of uh -huh. um, just a quick question about uh, subsidized parking. I think if you go back to the slide you have with the uh, choices, um, there we go. So this is the, I think verbatim of how it was asked. So subsidized parking at home is not really defined. So. Uh, we have free, as in fully subsidized parking at work, and then discounted partially subsidized parking at work. So, Suzanne, did you aggregate those two choices when you um, reported uh, what you did in the next couple of slides? No, I just, I only reported free, fully subsidized. Okay, so then uh, that's the definition, that it's uh, completely free. So, we did not define subsidized parking. Yeah, the, the question is, has it? I didn't define it. We didn't define it. Okay, so just going back, I think there was a question from uh, Devin. I don't know if you're still online or not. 
Uh, it was a question related to uh, underrepresentation mm -hmm. and data that uh, various folks, uh, uh, jurisdictions, agencies collect. Um, Devin, are you still online? I'm just looking at the list. Uh, maybe. Yes. Not. Oh, yes. I'm still here. Do you want to elaborate on what you're asking? I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah. So um, I guess when you're in planning school or if you're working in a jurisdiction and you're going through all the comp plan stuff and year after year and comp plan after comp plan cycle, you're seeing the same exact data and you're implementing these plans that can coincide with like the, the climate change element, which is like what CTR is for Muckle Teo at this point. Um, you're not really seeing any change. It's maintaining things when it seems like all of these like surveys are trying to make things better, but it looks like we're actually going backwards with the data. And I'm wondering if there's like other ways or, or to make things better because people are being called back into office now. They are being required to be on site instead of work from home like these things are starting to become political issues and it's mm -hmm. not um helping survey data at this point so i'm wondering if there's like other things that we can do or if there's a, a point in which we can start implementing policies or that, that are like you have to do this or if that's too much um, I'm going to take a stab at this. Uh, I think, Gil, um, you might want to jump in. I, I, I heard a number of things, um, and uh, I'm I'm trying to think about how um, they, they kind of connect with each other. First, I want to kind of point out something that basically Suzanne uh, alluded to, which is there's tension between the idea of working from home and then the uh, greater kind of economic development and having people in workplaces where the local economies may depend on it. So what we're all saying in terms of like lowering VMT and that might contribute to climate change um, or reversing climate change is the opposite of the mandates, uh, even ones from um, uh, private employers, as well as, you know, the counties and the cities that are saying they're recalling employ employees coming in. Um, I, I think the story is a little bit more nuanced than once you recall people in that people will um, definitely drive more. Uh, we're looking at regional data. So uh, I was having this conversation with Suzanne the other day that, for the city of Seattle and King County, where they have most of their employees in downtown, the ones that are doing office work, um, they're probably not all driving in because the city and county don't necessarily provide free parking or even subsidized parking for everybody. So them recalling might be very different than Microsoft, who doesn't have a uh, actual policy. You know, Microsoft is still on a come as you want but they have plenty of free parking, right? So I think if Microsoft recalled their uh, people would be very different than an employer somewhere where it's more transit rich and kind of serve. So I think it's a very nuanced thing. Uh, what I didn't totally get from your question was kind of like um, the connection to the survey data. I think the survey data can reveal certain patterns at certain levels, uh, but some questions deserves more nuanced look at it, and we may or may not have the capacity to do that. So I agree that there's a lot of things that look like they're doing, but in some ways they might be worse. Um, but I think the devil's in the details. Gil, do you want to speak to like policies or anything related to what Devin brought up? I, I guess so maybe, maybe I would just, uh, my thoughts on this, Brian, were uh, like, the purpose of your survey, like, is it really is to kind of help us identify, observe behaviors, right? And and then the beauty of this being so frequent is kind of we get to observe data, uh, observe changes and and behavior over time. And I think one of the stories I've heard you all say in the past is like as we expand out light rail and starting to observe, uh, are people actually doing those bus rail connections and and how are they getting to 
uh, transit and, and those high capacity transit. So it, that's kind of the real purpose here. And why do we do long range planning? I mean, another great thing about our regional transportation plan is every four years, again, kind of like every two years we do these household travel surveys, every four years we do a plan update and it's a long range vision out there to 2050, but they kind of tell us what to do next. Uh, I mean, try to, like if we, the best plans will kind of try to help us identify that. So maybe just, I don't know if this is really answering Devin's question, but it really, I think we're just trying to like, observe these, these data trends and, and then try to think about in the TDM world, how do we help um, how do we help make those changes in travel behavior? And a part of TDM is trying to get people to walk, bike, roll, uh, take transit rather than driving alone. And so um, I, I think that's just kind of I guess what I would say there. I'm not sure I'm really answering the question, but <laughs> that's I think that kind of clarifying that aspect of things. Um, there's a couple of questions in the q and I, I wonder if we should... Um, Take those and 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 then maybe see if um, there's anything else we want to do before transitioning on to our local CTR planning work. Um, Suzanne, you said you wanted to respond to Colton's. Uh, uh, he has. Have you considered asking if the employer offers parking cash out? Uh, I didn't mean to make that be to the group. I was, but I will respond to it. <laughs> um, yeah, I meant to respond to it like in the oh, chat. Oh, okay. But I wasn't. Uh, I was reading I, the thing. <laughs> that's a good idea. I like your. I like your idea. Parking cash out. It's yeah. Can we put that on the list of of benefit? That's a good one. I like that one. That's a great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. And then um, I think maybe uh, given that we're over time, I wonder if uh, we could ask people to. Uh, as I mentioned in a response to one, we're going to post these slides to give you a chance to kind of re review them and, and think about them a little bit further. But why don't you, uh, like, uh, we're curious here at PSOC, if you have other questions or other data, as, as Suzanne was alluding to, there's a lot, of, it's a very rich data set. So if you want to reach out to us, if there's additional information you'd like to see what we can find out about TDM, our next TDM convening, which we expect will be early in 2025, we could uh, bring back some information, or if that's too long, we could maybe send some information out to this or put on a PSRC blog post to make sure the TDM uh, uh, community hears about that. So uh, how about we go with that? Uh, and uh, that allows us to move on to our local CTR work since there is a deadline looming for that. Uh, and we wanna make sure we cover that. But thank you again, uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Brian, for uh, joining us today. I, I know that this is really a popular topic with uh, this group. And uh, so uh, thank you again for sharing all this information with, with us. Um, Thanks for inviting me. I love all of your work. Yes. <laughs> Um, Aaron, I think we're going to turn it over to you to, to cover uh, the plan for local CTR um, plans, so to speak. Yeah. Sorry, it's a little slow coming back here. Oops. Okay. Hopefully that worked. Yep, yep, looks like. Okay, good. Sorry, <laughs> struggled there for a second. Um, yeah, so I know we don't have um, a ton of time, um, but, and this should be familiar to folks that have been, uh, attended our April meeting or, or various other meetings over the summer. Um, but um, I guess I kind of skipped over this. Um, as a reminder for anybody that's new, um, we have four uh, commute trip reduction affected counties in the region, or all four of ours are, are affected, um, as well as many larger jurisdictions in those counties, um, and are required to do a 2025 to 2029 local CTR plan. Um, and those are due to WASHDOT uh, December 2nd. And so kind of working back from that, uh, PSRC also is supposed to review those plans. So we've asked um, folks to submit them by September 20th. So that's why we're talking about this today. Um, so again, if you, hopefully, uh, if your CTR affected, you know, and have been working on your plan, um, but we did just do like a, a quick highlight. So all those ones in yellow, um, this is the full list from the state. All of those in yellow are in, um, the four county region, um, and have the requirement to develop this plan. Um, as I just mentioned, um, we have set a deadline of September 20th, um, which is coming up soon, um, and are asking folks to email their plans to transportation at psrc.org. Um, and if you have 
questions about, you know, the how far along you are in the development of your plan, what level of completeness should the should a draft be, um, please reach out to Gil and I. Our emails will be at the end of this presentation. Um, and then we're committing to getting feedback no, no later than November 1st. Um, we will do our best to get through these as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and again, I'll cover this a bit in the, actually, I'll just go to the next slide and come back. Um, our, our role here is really to review for plan consistency. And so um, this is, we're, we're just looking for like, is there anything in the local CTR plan that is inconsistent with the goals of our regional transportation plan? I think most of these plans will be consistent in terms of trying to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips. That's that's consistent with our regional plan and messaging. So um, we don't anticipate there being a lot of issues, but have been asked to do this review. Um, also want to emphasize this is sort of a, a friendly review. We're not trying to make more work for anyone. So um, we won't make a lot of little nitpicky comments um, or, or anything like that, uh, but just are doing a broad review. Uh, but then the secondary piece, we will be, if you're like, oh, are they even reading these? Uh, we will be because we're also planning to, as we mentioned earlier, pull what we can from these plans to inform um, our both our existing conditions, as well as as we start to scope out how we'll address TDM in the Regional Transportation Plan update. Um, so we will be reading them all carefully, uh, but we will also be trying to get you that feedback on the initial, is this consistent or not, as quickly as possible. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, Washdot is expecting these uh, no later than December 2nd. Um, we've been trying to emphasize that no later than because early early submissions are welcome by us, by Washdot, by everyone. Um, and uh, then they'll be doing the uh, staff review and then submitting that as a recommendation to the TDM technical committee for consideration and adoption, hopefully. Um, the other thing on this slide, in addition to explaining what we're looking for in these plans, is just a reminder that on our website, we did put up um, several resources. These were all listed in the WASHDOT guidance as like other plans you might want to look at when developing your CTR plan. Um, so this is this image kind of shows what it looks like on our page, but each of those categories, regional plan, transit plan, are a drop down. So you can we tried to put things all in one spot in the hopes of making it easier for folks, um, knowing that every every city, every transit agency, their website is different. So um, that's a bit about um, what, what we're looking for, when we're looking for it. Um, and then finally, again, why we're looking at this, um, you know, we, we don't have a super recent like formal CTR plan um, because that was put on hold for a while there, for several years. And so, uh, but as Gil mentioned earlier, our regional transportation plan is a TDM plan. Um, we, we are setting goals and policy direction for the region to really shift away from single occupancy vehicle trips um, and really support a multimodal network. So that's what we'll be kind of um, comparing or evaluating local plans against is that current regional transportation plan. Um, but then we'll also be taking information from your local plans to kind of shape the next regional transportation plan. Um, so I tried to go through that really quickly. Uh, apologies if it was too quick, but mostly just because we want to make sure there's some time. If folks have any questions or concerns um, about these plans, we wanted to leave a little bit of space um, for folks to ask questions. Yeah, and Aaron, I think uh, um, I, I may have missed if you said this because I think we did ask about this in April. We asked if folks wanted to meet uh, before or after the deadline, and we heard yes before the deadline that we set. Uh, I think uh, part of our thinking, at least here at PSSC, was that we might have received some early uh, submittals. We didn't really, so we don't really have much to talk about in terms of what you all are going to send to us. But uh, so this is our opportunity. This is your opportunity to kind of you have Aaron and I. We'll be uh, keep people on the team that reviews this. We we as you saw the list. I think it's. 40 plus, uh, we have like two thirds of the CTR plans in the state coming to us. Uh, so we're probably gonna be others uh, on our team who are looking at these as well, trying to get them through to you by that November 1st deadline back to you. Um, so you'll have uh, some of our time here today. If you have questions for us, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, we really, we're kind of anticipating you'll be sending us something, but we don't really know what they're gonna look like right now. So um, I see Bradley has his hand up. Thank you, Fred. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just clarifying. I asked at a previous meeting on our public engagement process because I noticed in the timeline that it is um, uh, slated for August. However, I pushed back a bit on that date for the public engagement just because it uh, laid in the middle of summer during this month when a lot of people are out. So we did a lot of um, survey work beforehand early in the summer and most of our public engagement periods can be happening between September and October. And so I wanna make sure for your review process, as long as we have documented what we plan to do in the course of September and October, um, will that suffice for your review as we're completing our public engagement process? Aaron, you can add in, but I think that will suffice for us. Uh, again, for us, it's a regional consistency uh, view. I think what you're talking about will be something the state will be asking right. about. And so, uh, yeah, um, certainly feel free to send us a draft or whatever. And I think our goal, I, I, just for clarification for folks, that September 20th deadline is for if you want feedback before that by November 1st. Uh, you can send it to us afterwards as well. We're just not guaranteeing we're going to get it to you by November 1st. And so um, I, I wonder with 40 plus plans, are they all going to come in uh, by that December 2nd? I, the state seemed to think that was going to happen. Uh, I'd be really surprised. We do comprehensive plan reviews and uh, I don't think we ever get them all <laughs> in, in, in by the deadline. So I know that there's like other, you know, um, you know, um, things to kind of uh, consider for um, enforcement and things like that uh, uh, on those and folks are really look at our funding kind of things and trying to get that before funding competitions rather than the state deadlines. But I don't know if something like that's going to happen with CTR, but um, I hope that answered your question, Bradley. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure you didn't need the full details of what we heard from the public for your review. Okay, okay. Good. All right, thank you. And I was just going to chime in, Gil, because I saw there was a question in the Q&A, and I think it's in a similar vein. And I think these are the kind of questions we were expecting today. Um, it says, can you speak to the completeness of the draft required for what we send you um, on that 920 deadline? Um, so I, I'm kind of maybe going on off off the road here a little bit, but I, I think it would be useful um, to Gil's point, if you don't have a draft ready by the 20th, if you could at least send us an email and maybe let us know, like, here's where we're at in the process, here's when we'll have a draft for you to review. Like, I think that would be ideal if we've at least had like contact with everybody by September 20th. Um, so we kind of know where you're at. Um, I know we, we have already had contact and questions from a few folks where we've kind of said like, send us what you have by the 20th, but you know, we, and to Bradley's point just then, maybe all of the outreach isn't done yet, or, you know, um, again, this initial review is just to kind of see, is the direction this plan is moving consistent with our regional plan? Um, we do want to eventually see those final plans, because as we mentioned, we we want to learn what you learned from your outreach, and, and we, we are hoping to kind of mine these for information for our regional plan. Um, so eventually, we'll, we'll want to see the complete plans. Um, but I think just if, if everybody could maybe kind of, yeah, maybe make that commitment to um, if you're not going to meet the September 20th deadline, at least have reached out to us by then to kind of give us a status update. Does that sound reasonable, Gil? Sorry. Kind yes, of communication is always that. something we're, uh, <laughs> uh, community, yes, I mean, over uh, if you, there's doubt, please communicate with us rather than not. I mean, similar to the, we, the uh, survey that Aaron talked about earlier. Right. And we we were like, why are we not getting responses and come to find out somebody retired or whatever? And we didn't know. Right. We did, So so there's a so we'd rather hear that you all are. And it sounds like this person didn't know about the September 20th deadline. We did announce that in April for our April um, um, uh, meeting. And uh, and as that was the state requirement that we have a um, a deadline established for, for our reviews. And, and, and we identify that. So uh, that's what we've done. Um, so anyhow, um, I think. Per Aaron's point, please please communicate with us. If you're not going to make the September 20th, you're going to turn it in on November, whatever. Uh, we we just want to know you're working on it, and uh, that our region is going to be uh, compliant with those CTR rules. Any other questions? And I, I think I, I again we because we didn't have anything really we were wondering if this was going to be a relatively short um, discussion topic. Uh, maybe just reiterating what Aaron was saying, uh, we do have a transport that that um, email address. I think transportation at psrc.org is where you'll be sending the information. 
Um, and um, and because we are just we'll have some vacation uh, going on towards the end of this summer, right? Sending it to that uh, to that email address will make sure it gets into the queue for our review process. And uh, if you have uh, questions uh, on this topic, please follow up with Aaron or I. We'll, like I say, we're both kind of the uh, we'll be involved in the reviews of these uh, of these plans and possibly others, given the volume of, of plans we're going to be getting here in the next few weeks. Um, and with that, I think maybe uh, we can uh, uh, move on to the next thing, unless there's any other burning questions about this. Um, and, and I guess maybe just the reiterating what Aaron said, we will be going back. Uh, I mean, this is a regional consistency review, and I think we will have more opinions and thoughts and feedback for you when we take try, take, try the exercise of rolling up all your local CTR plans into our regional plan, uh, because that is kind of what we do typically. Uh, we typically don't uh, try to lead off with just putting a, a stake in the sand just randomly someplace. We try to like look at what the, what uh when we do transit uh, uh, performance or those types of things, we roll up the information from the six transit agencies. We look at the uh, 80 plus local jurisdictions. We try to roll that information up into a regional uh, um, number to be able to tell us where we're at. And we're gonna try to do that with these uh, CTR plans. And so those might be some follow-up questions you get next year as we are engaging in our uh, development of TDM section for the regional transportation plan. Um, with that, uh, why don't we turn it over to the TDM roundtable, Aaron? Yeah, thanks, Gil. Um, so uh, this is the time in the meeting when folks have um, information they want to share with other implementers or uh, topics to suggest for um, future meetings and conversations. Um, this is sort of the open space time uh, for folks to make those comments, uh, but to maybe kind of kick it off while you're thinking. Um, Couple reminders, I uh, was very excited. So put a picture of the new uh, Linwood City Center link station up here as a reminder that opens Friday. I know many ETCs are maybe sharing that information with um, employers, especially around the new stations that are opening. Um, so that's very exciting transit news this week. Um, we also did wanna share that um, we'll be working on the 2025 work program. Um, the website Gil shared at the beginning has our current 2024 work program that kind of outlined um, what, what work PSRC is doing in the TDM space for the year, as well as what those key points are where we're hoping to have one of these meetings and get input from stakeholders. So we will be working on that in the coming months and sending it out to our TDM contact list. Again, instructions for how to be added to that list. Gil went over that at the beginning and those are um, instructions are on that slide. Um, also, I'll, we'll be posting all of the slides to our website. I think that question came up earlier. Um, and then uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email to our contact list, um, maybe letting you know those slides are up on the website, as well as with the reminder of that September 20th deadline, where to send your um, plans to, and trying to kind of summarize some of the key points here today. Um, and then two other things were, uh, we know WashDOT has been working very hard with their consultant steer on the CTR program equity study um, and had a, a, a little sharing session on that uh, last week and um, have said that the uh, final report for that study will be coming here in early September. Um, so wanted to remind folks that that's um, coming out soon, as well as we know many people on this call attend the CTR implementers and the TDM technical committee meetings. Those are, are both happening next week, right after Labor Day. So um, just a friendly reminder, these are things folks might be interested in coming up. Um, I think that's it from us. So I can be quiet now in case anybody else has something to share. Yeah, why don't you take down the slides, Aaron? At this point, I think we will invite people. There's no need to use the Q&A section. You can turn on your camera. You can unmute yourself and share any, any announcements or information you want to share with the group. And while people are thinking about that, Alexa, do we have some uh, kind of uh, um, end of uh, show kind of uh, feedback polling? Uh, why don't we put that up and let people kind of respond to that as people are thinking about things? Uh, we just kind of like get a little feedback on as we did in April. Like, what do people think about the meeting? Uh, there kind of like any feedback you can give us about about that for um, us to um, consider as we think about uh, the next meeting in early 2025 uh, after we've developed our uh, and kind of updated the TDM work program on, which will be really focused 2025 on our regional transportation plan and the uh, regional CTR component of that plan. 
But uh, please feel free to share other things that are going on in the TDM world if you uh, have anything to share. And if folks don't, uh, we can kind of like let you go. Uh, uh, um, if you please feel free, I'll kind of give it as an indication. Uh, we don't need to keep you here till noon. So if people are don't have anything to share and you fill out your survey, uh, you can feel free to log off. It was great to see everyone today, um, and uh, at least see your names. Uh, as people didn't really turn on cameras very much, but but uh, uh, um, it was glad to see you all. And please keep an eye out for upcoming uh, events and information that we'll be sharing over the coming months. So thank you all. Yes, thanks. Thank you.